Hi, in this video we will explore the distributional hypothesis from a paradigmatic perspective. This means that we focus on individual words and the words that tend to co-occur with them. Just to give you a recap, the distributional hypothesis proposed by Zelig Harris states that similarity in meaning results in similarity of distribution. And by distribution, Harris refers to the contexts in which a given linguistic unit, such as a word, occurs. What the paradigmatic perspective refers to in this case is that we focus on individual words, or lemmas in this case, rather than looking at their distribution across some units of analysis, such as a clause, as we did in the previous video. To put it simply, we try to characterize individual lemmas numerically by capturing information about the contexts in which they occur. We'll start by getting the unique lemmas from the data frame that we created in the previous video by using the columns attribute of the data frame and its toList method to get a list of unique lemmas in our example data. This gives us a list of 23 string objects that give the unique lemmas in our vocabulary. To set us up for tracking the co-occurrences of these lemmas, we will create a new pandas data frame and use the list of lemmas for both the index, that is the rows, and the columns. We then fill each cell in the data frame with the value zero using the fill na method. This gives us a data frame with the same categories across the columns and the rows with values of zero in each cell. We can think of this empty data frame as a beginning of a co-occurrence matrix which can be used to track how many times a given lemma occurs within some distance of another lemma. So what we want to do is to fill this data frame with information about co-occurrences of lemmas. To make this easier, we will start by combining all of the spacey doc objects that we have currently under a list named docs into a single doc object. This can be achieved by importing the doc object from the tokens submodule of spacey and then creating a new doc object and using the from docs method to create a combined doc object. This method takes a list of doc objects as its input and returns a single doc object which we assign under the variable combined underscore docs. To track the co-occurrences of words, let's assume that the two preceding or following words on either side of the word constitute its neighbors. And this is the information that we want to capture in our data frame. To do this, we can use the NBOR or neighbor method of a spacey token. This method takes a number as its input, which determines the position of the neighbor relative to the current token. So for example, we could give the value minus one to the neighbor method to get the previous token. The problem is that not all of the tokens have neighbors, so we need to take this into account in our code when we look for co-occurring lemmas. We start by looping over the tokens in the spacey doc object named combined underscore docs. We then define a nested for loop, that is a for loop within a for loop that loops over a list with four numbers. These numbers refer to the neighboring tokens. So, for example, as I said previously, minus one would indicate the previous token. We then use the try statement to attempt to run the following code block under the try statement. So what we do here is we take the 
neighbors of the token one by one by looping over the positions and storing their lemma under the variable neighbor underscore lemma. We then store this information in the data frame using the at accessor, which uses brackets to access a specific cell of the data frame. So in this case, we take the lemma of the token that we're currently processing during the loop over the combined docs doc object. And then we take the current neighboring lemma and increment the value of this cell by one using the plus and equal sign. So just to recap, for every token, we loop over the four positions and try to observe the neighboring lemmas and add this information to the data frame. However, if the token that we're looping over doesn't have neighbors, which raises an index error, we use the accept statement to avoid an error and simply instruct Python to move on to the next position. This collects the co-occurrence counts for each lemma within two lemmas on either side into the data frame. And we can now examine the result by calling the variable lemma underscore df. This gives us the co-occurrence counts for each lemma. And we can see, for example, that the lemmas Tallinn and Helsinki co-occur within two words of another twice in the data. Note that in this data frame we have the same information in the columns and the rows. We can think of the information that we've collected into the columns and the rows for each lemma as a vector that describes the context in which the lemma occurs. In other words, we use the counts to encode information about the collocated words. And this, of course, takes us back to the quip by J.R. Firth about the way you can know a word by the company it keeps. We can also relate this to the distributional hypothesis as we would expect paradigmatic alternatives, that is, lemmas with similar meanings, that can be used roughly interchangeably to have similar distributions in terms of the contexts in which these lemmas occur. Because we now have numerical representations in the form of 23-dimensional vectors for each lemma, we can use cosine similarity as introduced in the previous video to measure the distance between these vectors. So in this cell, we get the vectors with the co-occurrence counts for the words or lemmas Tallinn and Helsinki and compare their cosine similarity. Know that we have to wrap these vectors into brackets for input to the cosine similarity function from scikit-learn. This gives us a value of 0 0.42, which might suggest some similarity between the vectors um, as 1.0 would indicate perfect similarity but of course here we have a set of data that is quite limited with just 23 lemmas but still this suggests that the lemmas Tallinn and Helsinki occur in similar contexts which we know to be true from the example that we examined in the previous video. Of course, we could refine these representations by observing more data, thus having a more complete picture of the contexts in which these words occur. But the problem, again, is that by increasing the size of the vocabulary, we would also have to increase the dimensionality of the embedding space. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. And if you have any questions about the distributional hypothesis, feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks.